Welcome to Sculpture That Tells a Story. This is a collaboration between Abby M. Taylor Fine Art and Holster Fine Art. We are at Holster Fine Art currently, and we've chosen works uh, which we feel are content rich, either in the historical sense or in terms of artistic movements. Um, we start in the front of the exhibition here with works by Americans. And in regards to American sculpture in the 19th century, a new art form uh, for American sculptors was carving in marble, which was an age-old uh, art form in Italy, of course. One of our earliest Americans to travel to Italy was Thomas Crawford. We wanted to highlight this piece in some way. Uh, before we started the exhibition, we believed this piece to be by Thomas Waldo Story also an American carver in marble. The piece is unsigned. Uh, after we mailed our cards for the exhibition, uh, we had an exciting discovery. Uh, Brett Holster uh, was watching a video of our restorer, Steve Taddy, and in the last seconds of the video, discovered a marble in the back um, shot, and it was a very large version of what we have here. Uh, in the larger version, there is a young boy and a female asleep in the woods, or really rather dead in the woods. It's called Bathe in the Woods. And our piece that we have here is exactly what we see in the male figure. This was a very famous work for Thomas Crawford at the time. A version of this piece in the larger form is at the Metropolitan Museum. Also up front here, we have another American carver in marble a work by Edward Thaxter, who died at a very young age, um, was promising to be a great sculptor. He died in Italy, and this piece was in his studio at the time. Uh, very classic, almost in the same sense as a, a Hiram Powers work. This piece is called Thought. Another work by uh, the American uh, Edward Thaxter. It's uh, called Reproof, and this once again is a smaller work broken out from a larger work. Um, so this is just sort of the bust of the child uh, taken out from a larger model that the, the sculptor did. Then we move on over to uh, one of my favorite pieces in the exhibition, um, which is uh, by Goodson Borglum. And Goodson Borglum, of course, uh, is most famous for having done Mount Rushmore. Borglum went over to England and visited with John Ruskin, who was a great luminary writer, critic, um, a great mind in the art world. And he sat with Ruskin in the last year of Ruskin's life as he was ailing and as he was dying, uh, modeled this work and cast it when he came back to the United States. Um, it is simply one of the most interesting works I've ever seen in terms of the play between the texture and the work, the sort of rough hewn texture in the robe, and then the um, very striking modeling, the sharp modeling in the knuckles and in the, uh, the nose. You almost feel as though you can um, sense the bones underneath the skin there. One of our other uh, important American works in this exhibition, this is a Herman Schrady, and it's of George Washington at Valley Forge. Uh, Schrady was commissioned to do a monument of George Washington and um, of his own choice, and, and what won him the commission was he chose to depict Washington on his horse at Valley Forge, which was while he was commander prior to being president, and he uh, is sort of in the depths of despair. The horse in this piece is almost just as wonderful as the figure of Washington himself. No exhibition would be quite complete without a work by Augustus St. Gaudens. Augustus St. Gaudens is one of our greatest American sculptors. Uh, this is a small relief by him. He loved doing these small reliefs. And this one is of uh, Scottish-born uh, author Robert Louis Stevenson. Now, this is what's called the second version of this relief, um, and it's, uh, it was cast quite a bit. One of the uh, highlights of this exhibition, um, a fascinating work by Herbert Hazeltine. The name of the piece is Soissons Cans, uh, meaning 75 guns, or Rather, this is a depiction of the 75 millimeter gun, artillery gun, which the French used to fight the Germans. 
Um, the, this gun was put into heavy production by the French and it's really one of the great reasons they could fight the Germans. Uh, and Hazeltine uh, is a young sculptor as well. He models this work uh, when he's on leave at various junctures. And being an ambitious young man, uh, does a sweeping sort of uh, composition here, which you rarely see in sculpture, uh, starting with the, the, uh, the 75 millimeter gun here coming down, uh, probably what is a muddy embankment, um, hillside in the country, and uh, the piece, every single movement and gesture uh, as you go through this work is really quite dynamic. We're going to switch over to the Europeans, and in front of me here is a very major relief uh, done by Neil Bordell, who of course is one of the great pioneers of modern sculpture. And around 1912, uh, some architects and, and Bordell get together and they need to work on the facade of what's going to be the, uh, the Théâtre de Champs-Élysées. This is really just a small part of that relief taken from the part that's called the Muses. And this smaller one is a version as well. A sculptor would do this very often. They would come up with a relief um, from a very major monumental work that they've done to um, sell to patrons and to focus in on certain decorative elements within the frieze. Over to my left here uh, is what I sort of like to call our wall of European masters and we have uh, another one of my favorite sculptors here. This is a work by little known uh, Pio Fedi. Uh, he didn't do many small works that circulated, but he uh, was a sculptor of major proportions. Uh, if you go to Italy uh, and Rome, uh, you see many major works by this sculptor. And so he's one of the finest carvers in marble in the 19th century um, in Italy. And I love looking at the feet and the hands on this work, which um, are of a size and strength that you don't normally see on a female form. This piece is called Immortality. And to its left here is a work by Emil Cower, who is not an Italian, he's German, comes from a long line of German sculptors. There are nine sculptors within four generations of the Cower family. And on this piece, I love to point out that uh, she's a crouching figure and yet uh, he makes her highly elegant. It's, it's really a wonderful composition and study in diagonals in many directions. As well, I'm going to um, point out the uh, Emil Bordel here. This actually is a small mount monument by the uh, sculptor. Bordel was the artist we just saw over there who did the uh, facade of the Théâtre de Champs-Élysées. This is a monument to uh, Charles Debussy, and uh, it's uh, a piece which was inspired by Debussy's composition, Afternoon of the Fawn. Uh, it's an outdoor sculpture, it was meant to be outside, and there are two or three other versions of this uh, in France. Um, wonderful work by, by this sculptor. One last very important note, even though it's a smaller work on this uh, wall here, is a piece by Charles Cordier. Cordier holds a very special place in 19th century sculpture. Uh, he was interested in ethnology and uh, really made his body of work about studying the division of race and mankind different characteristics. Cordier sought to uh, uh, show that beauty was not specific to one race, and you can see that in works such as, as this piece. Along the European front as well, um, one of the great masters of all time was uh, Jean Faldier. Uh, Faldier taught Rodin, for instance, to sculpt. Uh, this is his depiction of Diana the Huntress. Um, someday I've always had the hope that somebody will do an exhibition of uh, all the different Dianas interpreted by uh, sculptors. There are a lot of fabulous ones out there. This, of course, uh, is one of the, uh, the great depictions of Diana, um, very classical in form and unforgettable.